or tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2019 Summer Family Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Friday evening, July the 5th, 2019. Carla B. Todd is the speaker of the service teaching on equipping and perfecting the saints. Good evening. Good evening. I love Lake Hamilton. It's good to be back here. I haven't been here as often as I have been in the past, but God is doing a new thing, and I'm rolling with Him. <laughs> Amen. If you don't stay with the cloud, <laughs> you'll get dry. But anyway, um, first of all, I want to bind every spirit of Antichrist that would hinder God's people from receiving the Word tonight. Yes. I bind every distraction, every spirit that would want to come in, that Jezebel spirit likes to come in and disrupt meetings and and take them over because she hates the word of God going forth. So I just bind all of them right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I ask you to send angels right now to come and do battle in the heavens over this place. That we'll have an open heaven to receive what you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name. I ask you to help me, Lord. (laughs) Okay, so um, one of the things I love about Lake Hamilton is, well, I didn't know anything about deliverance. Um, And you know what I've learned? That without deliverance, the best you can have is a mixture in your own body. And that deliverance is a body ministry. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, Jesus did that. And then he told everybody else that was around there when he came forth that he was bound with grave clothes, it says in the Word. And he said to them, who were them? All of those that witnessed him coming out of the grave with the grave clothes. And he said to them, loose him and let him go. And we all have grave clothes. And it is a body ministry for each of us to help each other remove those grave clothes with deliverance, prayer and deliverance. Casting out devils. Yep. Casting out devils in the name of Jesus. Okay. So tonight I want to share a message. I better get on page one about equipping the saints. I love to teach. I I know that I was called to teach. I always wanted to be a teacher. But school was not my strong point. So, but I'm glad, you know. I was going to go to college to be a teacher, but uh, algebra (laughs) 2 was a stumbling block. So much so, the professor made me stay after class one day, and he said, what is your major? (laughs) I wish I had said math. (laughs) But I was scared that he asked me to stay after class. He said, no, um, I said secretarial science, because I had gotten out of education, because they made me take speech and had cameras and all this stuff, and there was no way I could stand in front of my peers. So you see what, that grave clothes was stripped off of me. So now I can stand before people and not be scared. God had a different plan. I am a teacher, just not a school teacher. But every time when I was young, when I would go places, they would say, oh, are you a school teacher? So, you know, there's a mantle that came down my family line. My dad was a teacher at heart. Every conversation ended up in the Bible with God and a spiritual lesson, which I appreciate today. 
He died when I was 30. He was really my best friend. And um, I had to transfer that best friend thing from my daddy to my daddy. I had to replace that. And that was a good thing. That was necessary. Okay, so I'm going to start in Ephesians chapter 4. I bet y'all thought I was going to say 6. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. Now, I have all of these marks, so it didn't take me a long time to find them. Uh, we are going to go through a lot of scriptures, so if you just want to jot down the scripture, just get the CD. I mean, uh, if you're like me, when I'm taking notes, I've already missed the, the other three things they said after I'm taking the note. So I don't want you to miss anything. So just jot down the scripture, and I'm going to read them. Ephesians 4, 10 through 16. This is talking about Jesus. Um, he, in verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might feel all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That's what I'm calling this, equipping the saints. I should call it perfecting the saints because that's what the word says. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be no more children. Be no more children. It's time to grow up. Tossed, the children will be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Okay, so that's what equipping the saints is all about. I used to love to teach, but now I feel like my call is to the body of Christ for the perfecting of the saints. And one of those things that we're going to talk about tonight is equipping you to stand, giving you some tools, sharing with you some strategies that the enemy uses and what to do when those strategies show up. Because that was something I had no clue of. The devil came to our house and nearly destroyed our marriage, our finances, our children. It did destroy the peace of our home, the joy. Um, there was much destruction. And I didn't know what to do. I was getting whipped. I laid on the floor. Metaphorically, that's the right word. I didn't really. Well, sometimes I was laying on the floor. But it was like the enemy came in and gave me a sucker punch. And I was just laying there not knowing what to do, gasping for breath. And until God began to show me what was going on. Okay, so we're going to see a little bit of that tonight, too. So, I want to go to Genesis chapter 1 and read a scripture there, verse 2. I'm going to read verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth, this is verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I get a lot of emails from people, and I can honestly say that many of them write, and what I see when I read it is their lives having no form and void. Everything, so many things are out of order. There is so much confusion in the world today. I'm going to tell you how it caught me off guard. I was standing in the airport. You know how you line up before you get on the plane? And there was 1 through 30 here and 31 through 60 here. 
and I'm like number 40 something and up ahead in the first line was a person I didn't know if it was a male or a female I don't even know why I was um, caught you know to look at them but from the back beautiful hair long hair wavy I mean every girl would love to have hair like that but and then I, I looked at the clothes and then I thought I, you know what I can't tell if that's a man or a woman well he turned his head like this he has a full beard and I'm still trying to figure out if it's a man or a woman that's how confused I am today in this world with all of the a, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know what I'm talking about. There is confusion in the world. I can't even imagine if I'm confused, and I know what's going on, how confused the youth are, because I'm not sure they do know what's going on. But anyway, without form and void. Some of you may have come here, and your lives are without form and void. There is mass confusion, chaos, trouble everywhere. But I want to tell you that God did not leave it like that. He is a God of order. And I think about the situations that, that I'm faced with sometimes in these emails, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, here, here is the path that God gave to us and all the things, uh, ways to live in order to stay on that path and have life as it should be. But so many have gotten so far off that path that if you talk about the path, it is like, what? What are you talking about? They cannot even relate to it. It is foreign. And that's really a shame. Okay, so... Then it begins to talk about how God put things in order. There is a little principle here that I want you to catch. It's, it says many times, about nine times I think, God said. God said. Now, when I minister with some people and I'm trying to uh, teach them something, well, I'm thinking that in my head. You know, I'm, I'm telling the devil in my head. I said, but God said, it doesn't say God had a thought that it would be nice if there was light. He said, many times we're going to have to open our mouths and say what needs to be said. You can't just think it. Pray it in your prayer closet. you got to say it. Okay? So, um... I'm talking about strategic things that we can do to make our lives more powerful in the Lord. Okay, the scripture that says, this is Matthew 17, 20. I'm going to flip over there. Because God challenged me whenever hail came to my house. And I'm crying out to him every single day. I'm crying out the same thing every single day because I... My life is falling apart, and I don't know what to do about it. So I'm calling out to God, crying out to God. And one day he stopped me and said, Did I say to you that if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, that you would ask me to move your mountain? Wow. No, I thought about it. I know what that scripture says. If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say to the mountain, Ye shall say. You don't ask God. He, he said ye shall say. I think a lot of our prayers go unanswered because we're asking God to do something that he has already given to us to do. It's time to start doing those things. Okay? This, this scripture came after the story of the the young boy that the daddy brought to be healed. Jesus was not right there with the disciples, but he brought the child to the disciples, and they tried to cast the demon out, and they couldn't remember. Uh, it doesn't say exactly what they did, but the boy fell down and started foaming at the mouth, and that was the end of it. 
So Jesus had to come and do it. So the disciples asked Jesus, why could we not cast it out? And what does he say? Right before he says, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, he says, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. He is talking to them about their unbelief, their lack of faith. And then after that, he says, how be it, this kind goeth not out except by prayer and fasting. He didn't, when they said, why could we not cast it out? He didn't say, because this is a really strong demon. And you've got to fast and pray before that thing is going to come out. That's not what he said. He was addressing their unbelief. He wants you to know that if you are having problems with unbelief, you need to be fasting and praying. That's how you're going to receive more faith. And, of course, by reading your word, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Um, There's a lot about fasting that we do, but sometimes people do it trying to make God move, make God do something. And that's not really the purpose. It, the, the fasting is to make you move from one place to another. And so, um, it, and fear and intimidation. I have a theory about this scenario with this boy. The minute, I think the disciples, Jesus had told them that they could cast out demons. I think they went to do exactly what he said. But when the boy fell and started foaming at the mouth, it scared them. The manifestation took them by surprise, and it caused fear and intimidation to rise up, and they backed off. And you're going to have to know that the devil works with the element of surprise. He loves to catch you off guard and to throw you off balance. So I want you to remember these things so that when they happen, you can stand where you need to stand and continue doing what you're doing until you cast the demon out. Because the devil's going to try to distract you from what Jesus Christ has given you the authority and power to do. He doesn't want you to do that. Okay, so Satan uses the element of surprise and fear is a faith killer. In my early years of of growing in the Lord, I heard this little sentence. Uh, Fear knocked at the door. Faith answered, no one was there. I love that because it's the absolute truth. So when he comes to knock on your door... You answer it with faith and not fear. He is an opportunist. You know, in Luke 4.13, this is when Satan was tempting Jesus, tempting Jesus, tempting Jesus. And it says, uh, 4.13, in verse 12, you know, Jesus answered, it is written, it is written, it is written. And in verse 12, it says, And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to to the test. And when the devil had ended all the testing, he departed from him for a season. When he's with, he'll leave. But believe me, he'll be back. He's never going to leave you alone. He hates you because you belong to Christ. It is He wants to move you away from God. That's what he did to Adam and Eve. He got them offended at God by telling Eve, God didn't want you to have that because then you're going to be like him. And she thought about it, and she ate. She took the word of the devil over the word of God. And I'm here to tell you we are living in the days where if you are tempted with something that the Word of God has said not to do, you better not listen to the devil. And the children in here, I want you to know, you know, uh, we all know and love the Scripture in Jeremiah 
Jeremiah 29, 11. We know that one by heart. Hopefully I do because I didn't mark it. I know the plans, God says, that I have for you. Well, I'm going to have to look at that because I don't want to misquote it. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. But nobody ever told me that Satan also had a plan for my life. And he has one plan, and that is to kill, steal, and destroy. And if you follow after him, you're going to have death and destruction. Maybe not physical death, but it might be physical death. But you're going to have death in areas of life, in life where you should be having abundant life. There's not going to be abundant life. There's going to be death and destruction. So I want you to know you need to adhere to the Word of God and what God says to us. In Daniel 7, I'm going to read something. I found this not too long ago. I know I've read it before, but it just didn't stick with me the way it stuck with me this day. Daniel is talking about the end times. And in verse 24, it says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High God. There's that spirit of Antichrist, and it's already in the world, Jesus told us. It's a spirit of Antichrist. So he's going to speak great words against the Most High God. We're having that in our society, speaking against the Word of God. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's what he's busy doing today, is wearing out the saints. That is also um, written again in the Word in Revelation chapter 13. Well, I'm going to read 12, 17 first. It says, And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war. Now, the woman is the church. And, and that will be specified in a minute. Um, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's not a future thing. That's, that's us. It's talking about us. We have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's who the enemy, the Antichrist spirit, is out to make war with. And then in 13.7, it says, well, speaking of the, this beast, um, in verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. That's us. He's going to make war with us. That's what he wants to do. And to overcome us, overcome them. And power was given over him all kindreds and tongues and nations. So, make no mistake, the enemy is making war with you. That's why we're all here. We're feeling the effects of the war that the enemy has brought to us. And he knows us. He has studied us. And that is in that, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. He knows us, okay? Um, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Jesus, uh, Paul is talking about forgiveness. I'm going to flip over there and read it. 2 Corinthians 2.11. It says this. Paul is talking about forgiveness, and he says to them in verse um, 9 and 10, for to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. 
And if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave it I, in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. See, for many years, even as a Christian, I was ignorant of his devices. And if you're ignorant of his devices, he can get an advantage over you. That's why I want to talk about these things that he uses to make war with us and to wear us out. So you know how to combat it when it comes to your house. We are not to be ignorant. That's one thing I love about deliverance. When I started learning about evil spirits, it was easier to forgive people because you can separate the evil spirit from the person. You can know somebody that is just really sweet and kind and giving and thoughtful and everything, but something happens and all of a sudden they're like this monster. Well, that's that's not God. Now, the sweet and good things, that's God. But that's God in them. But that monster, that's the evil spirit that is causing that kind of behavior. So when people wound us, if we can understand that it's not the God part of that person that wounded us, it's the evil spirit operating in the person. So you don't um, pull yourself away from that person, which is what we want to do because we don't want the monster anymore. But really and truly, God has given us tools to use, binding and loosing. You can bind that evil spirit in the person and then enjoy a relationship with the person until they are rid of that thing. And who knows? God may use you to bring the knowledge of that thing to them in order for them, for that grave clothes to be stripped off of them by a loving brother or sister in Christ. That's what we do for one another. And that's how you can um, bear people. Because it's not them. Now I'm going to say Ephesians chapter 6. Because we know this is, this is just a no-brainer. If, it says in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There it is right there. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. If you have a problem with your boss, a problem with a coworker, a problem with your husband or wife, a problem with your kids, it's not the flesh and blood. It's demon, demonic oppression, and demonic spirits that you need to deal with. If we wrestle not with flesh and blood, where is our warfare? It's in the spiritual realm. And we've really not been taught how to war in the spiritual realm. So binding and loosing, that's one thing we can do to uh, battle in the spirit realm. So we need to know his tactics and his strategies. One of my favorite scriptures, it still is, but really one that I used to quote all the time, is that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's why we need to know this stuff. We need to know it. Okay, but later, I saw the second part of the scripture. Because you have rejected knowledge, that's a serious thing. When you are given knowledge and you reject that knowledge, it says in Hosea 4, 6. Let me mark this one either, but it says that you will not be a priest to him. And that's what we're supposed to be, a priest. We are to be priests. Okay, Hosea. Does somebody have that? Hosea is running from me. Well, but there's more to it. I will also reject thee, and thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, and I will also forget thy children. There you go. It's a serious thing to reject knowledge, especially the knowledge of God. Um, you know, the Bible... The Bible covers everything. It covers everything. Everything, every problem you will ever have and every need you will ever have is covered in the Word of God. If you're having a problem, seek it out. 
instead of seeking the world's way. Um, my own brother has had some infirmities, and um, they have a lovely uh, non-denominational church. Many, it's growing like crazy. Lots of young people. Um, and I said to him, "Well, have you have you gone to your pastor and asked him to anoint you with oil and pray for you about this?" He goes, "Well, no." And I said, "Why?" I mean, the Bible clearly says if any among you are sick. I mean, I don't understand how churches call themselves a church, but they don't do what the Word of God says. That's confusion to me. <laughs> um, because what I have learned is every time I have obeyed the Word of God, it has opened doors for miracles. You want to see miracles in your life? Start doing what the Word says. He is a miracle-working God. But he works in parameters. You know, he has, he has set up principles and laws and, and things to work with that. So if we obey the Word of God, it will open doors for miracles. I have a lot of testimonies just ran through my mind, mine and some others, of, of things that, you know, people who were totally, you know, worldly people. They didn't go to church. They were good people. You know, and I want to give you a line. Good is not the requirement for heaven. Righteousness is. And apart from Jesus Christ, there is no righteousness. So if you're having conversations with people, well, I'm, you know, I'm a good guy. I mean, I'd I give, I give my shirt off my back, you know. Well, go read First Corinthians 13. You know, though you do this, though you do that. I mean, you can speak with tons of angels, tons of men. Uh, give everything you own to the poor. Hey, that is not the requirement for heaven. In, in this case, it says love is. But God is love. And you can't get to God without Jesus. He is our righteousness. Okay, so um, that is one of his tactics. He likes, um, he likes you to reject knowledge. It's an antichrist spirit. That's why I like to bind the Antichrist spirit. Okay? He likes to catch you off guard. He likes to do surprise attacks to knock you off balance. Just know that those things will come. When they come, go, oh, oh, this is one of those things that she talked about at Lake Hamilton. This is one of those surprise attacks. This is Satan. You know, he will even pull us away from the truth of what it really is, and we're running around trying to figure out why. That's what he does. He wants to get you in fear. He'll use feelings. Now, this this I love, how God showed me. And, and I, I learned it firsthand. It came out of my mouth to my son. We heard it the first time together. And I didn't even know it here to say it to him. I love it when God does that. I guess that's what you would call a revelation. But anyway, um, my son was struggling with something, and I told him, I said, listen, this is how it works. The devil projects the thought. It might not come directly from Satan, but it is from the kingdom of darkness. They'll use a friend, a coworker, somebody, anybody to project the thought. You know, you're just a you're just an arrogant son of a gun. Well, okay, so the thought is there. The thought has been projected at you. It's a it's a, a fiery dart. It's, it is projected and then the thought that you're thinking that you think is you know, now your thought, uh, and you did let it in, it creates a conflict in your mind. All of a sudden, you find yourself defending yourself from the thought. You're trying to prove that it's not true. Okay? So, we were created to live in perfect peace. And when something like that happens, it disturbs our peace. Now, this conflict that's going on in our mind starts secreting chemicals that should not be working. Because we're supposed to be at peace. 
So it starts secreting these chemicals, and those chemicals go all through your body. It gets in your bloodstream. It has an effect on your heart rate. It has an effect on your blood pressure. It has an effect on your digestive system. I mean, I, I used to, I would just lose it all <laughs> when, when I would get in those situations. But then it becomes a feeling in your body. And because we are human and we are relational, we want to tell people how we feel. So when I start hearing, I just feel like I, I can't do anything right. I just feel like I'm never going to get there. I just feel this. I just feel that. Immediately when I start hearing, I just feel, 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 I have to say, okay, hold up. Because that's what's going on. Now the feeling is there. Well, how many of you know that God is looking for those who will agree with his word? You know that? When you speak his word, he likes that. When you agree with his word, he likes that. When you start saying these feelings because of that projected thought, and then it comes out of your mouth, Satan is standing right here. Come on. Come on, just say it. Come on, just say it. Because he knows the power of our words. Well, I'm just, I'm just an arrogant son of a gun. <sighs> See, that's how Satan works. That's one of his strategies. So when you start having a thought, and God tells us what to do with those. In first, Second Corinthians, right there, 10-4. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Taking every thought captive, everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. I don't know how that one didn't get in there either. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Okay, for we, in verse 3, for we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, here it is again, we do not war. After the flesh, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. You know, we can think a lot of things. We can work ourselves into a, an anxiety attack. Amen. Just through thinking. It's working on you. It's stirring up that fear. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. There's that Antichrist spirit again. Against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay, this is one way that God taught me about how to combat those things. It's in the story of David and Goliath, and that is in 1 Samuel 17. And you can look this up yourself. It's too long to read the whole story. But you know the story. Goliath is this huge giant. David is this slight, he's a youth, he's little. And Goliath is belittling him, calling him names, trying to make him feel inadequate. Like, what do you think you're going to do, you little pipsqueak? I'm fixing to cut your head off and feed you to the fowl of the air. And you know what? David did exactly what we ought to do every time we receive a threat from the devil. He said, you're coming to me with your threats and your lies. Is Satan a liar? He's a liar. In this story, I learned that whatever the devil comes to me with, to lie to me, like, I've got all three of your kids. Well, that could have started that process. No, Lord, no, they, he doesn't have all three of my kids. I could start the process of the chemicals and the feelings and all of that. Um, because it doesn't matter what it looks like in the flesh. I'm going by what God said. Okay? And so, when it comes with that lie... You're never going to get that job. If it's against the word of God, what did he say in the beginning? I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. He, he has success for you. He has good things for you. And, and the devil's trying to make you believe him over God. Goliath 
See, he uses, Satan uses a spirit of magnification, I call it. Okay, I brought my phone up here because I'm going to give you all a simple illustration. I've done this with the kids before. I don't know if it's going to work, but let me try it. I wish I had a dark wall. But let's just say this is the light. You see the size of my hand? It's not that big. But if it comes between me and the light, see how big my hand looks now? Okay. That is what I call the spirit of magnification, and the devil uses it all the time because he wants you to think that he is bigger and more fierce than God. But he's not. We need to know what God has said. He has given us power over all the power of the enemy. So why, why would we shudder when he comes? We just need to remember the word of God and begin to speak it. I start my day off with that scripture. Lord, I thank you that you've given me power over all the power of the enemy. You need to do that first thing every day. You know why? Because Satan is a, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I, I look at it like a vicious dog. Let's say you live in a neighborhood on a cul-de-sac. Everybody's friendly with everybody. Y'all, y'all barbecue outside, have picnics all the time. And uh, somebody else moves into the cul-de-sac with a vicious pit bull. And now, if you go outside to talk with a neighbor, that's how I see the devil. Like that. So, until somebody takes that vicious dog and ties it to a tree on a short leash, you're not going to be able to move about your life like you should be able to. That's how I see the enemy. And that's exactly how he is. So, that is another tactic. And that's another strategy he doesn't want you to know about. So start exercising the power over the enemy and binding him first thing every morning. It, listen, it has put a stop to a lot of crazy nonsense in my life. The washing machine running over, the car breaking down, getting a flat on the way to the store. You know, just crazy, ridiculous stuff. That's what he loves to do. He is out to wear out the saints. How many of you feel a little worn out? It's time to start using some of these tactics that God has given us against the tactics of the enemy. If you don't know him, he's going to have his way with you. He's going to mess with you. He's going to bother your, even your prayers. You know, people don't like to think about this, but if you get up in the morning and you don't bind the enemy and you start saying your prayers, he has assigned demons to go listen to your prayers. That's what he does. Then he goes back and tells Satan what you're going to be doing, and he makes assignments against all of that. You think that is make-believe? It's not. I want to help you here. I'm trying to help you not be so worn out, not have so much chaos and disorder in your life. He's given you power over all the power of the enemy. Yeah, but I... I, I, I decree and declare every single day, and I did. That's part of it. We should all be doing that too. But there's the other side of it. If you're not doing both, it's not going to be as effective as it could be. Okay? So I want to encourage you to start doing that. Um, another thing he likes to do is to create distractions. Now, that is a very serious thing. Because God showed me years ago, this, these were the words, beware distractions. And you may have heard this, some of you may not have, but he, God shows me things in, in dreams. I didn't even realize that. But, but I can look back and realize how God has been training me in warfare in my dreams. Because in this particular dream, I was standing on the shore of an island, I don't know. I didn't see what was behind me. I just see the water out in front. It's crystal clear, beautiful water. I knew it wasn't the Gulf of Mexico. So anyway, um, there was a deck that went out, went across, and came back. So there was a big square of water, same water that was out there. But it was black, oily looking, spooky looking, ominous. And there were a group of people on the deck over here, 
and they're all looking out into the beautiful clear water and they were distracted not not a, a distraction meant to distract them but they were looking at other things they were looking at the beauty and they were looking at maybe um, or, uh, what are they thank you <laughs> those things <laughs> anyway they're looking at all this stuff and and I'm going to go join them because I like people so I'm on my way to join them but when I got halfway up on this left deck this huge crocodile just I hate crocodiles <laughs> just, they're, they're sneaky and that, he just floated to the water and all those bumps you know the water was oily and rolling off of his back and this was no normal crocodile the stomach was about this wide and it was long it was huge and so I was going to warn the people because the crocodile was looking over that way and before I could scream or anything the speed of light that crocodile was up on that deck and had eaten a man whole gulp one bite removed the man and I knew the man represented a leader. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.